Today's conversation is sponsored by First Generation Capital Partners. If you're an accredited investor and you want to find out more about investment opportunities, go to firstgencp.com forward slash invest. The key with buying real estate, right, is buying correctly. You know, you can go and overpay for properties and you're, you're, it's not going to be a great investment for you. you know, it's like buying at the top of the stock market. But even right now when the market's hot, if you're buying properties at a huge discount, you're probably going to be okay. And that's what we specialize in is finding those discounted properties. You're listening to the Going Long Podcast with Billy Keels, the number one podcast for long distance real asset investing. Welcome to the Going Long Podcast. We're back once again to continue to help to educate you so that you feel much more comfortable as well as confident investing beyond your backyard. And yes, I am your host, Billy Keels. And I am really looking forward to sharing today's conversation with you. It's another one of these amazing conversations. Love the long distance lifestyle. You're going to find out all kinds of cool stuff. Before that, listen. If this is your first time here, it's fantastic. Really appreciate that you're here. And if you're back once again, thank you for coming back. And also, if you have already taken the next step in leaving us an honest written review as well as a rating, it's something that I cannot thank you enough for because as a result of this and many other other actions, we continue to move up the charts. We're moving up the charts together. So if you need help and you want to find, we've got a really quick video, especially on the Apple podcast platform. If you want to leave an honest written review as well as rating, we've got a nice little short video for you. You can check it out. Also, if you're looking for the old videos and the, or not old, but the ones that started in the very beginning, the videos or the audio podcast, you can go to billykeels.com when you get there. Screen's going to change a little bit find the podcast tab and you can see every single one of the previous 200 plus episodes. So go there, check it out. It'll be awesome. Lastly, if you're an accredited investor, you want to hang out with other accredited investors. You want to help to also find strategies to stop paying so much in W-2 taxes. Guess what? This is a group you probably want to check out. So send me an email, aiclub at billykeels.com. We'll connect, we'll talk, share exactly what we're doing, and you can gain access to some pretty awesome deals. Um, with that stated, we've got a guest today who is, you know, he took the traditional path. He went, he got the education, he got his engineering degree, things were working. He got his dream job, the bucket list, and he just realized that something was not right. So he decided, well, without any kind of plan B to to start over, real estate came across his path. He is now helping other people and doing that in a remote fashion. It's absolutely cool. You're going to love this guy's story. Um, And it's we're going to get to that in just a second. You're going to hear more from and learn from Mr. Mike DeHaan. And we'll get to that just after this. Are you a busy, high paid professional, someone who's made $200,000 the previous two years and also expected to earn $200,000 this year? Or maybe as a couple, you filed jointly and you've earned $300,000 the previous two years and also expected to earn $300,000 together this year. Or maybe yourself or as a couple, you have a million dollars in net worth, not including your home. Well, if you meet any of those criteria, then the IRS considers you to be someone who is an accredited investor. And so that probably means you're a top producing software sales executive, or maybe you're a highly paid consultant. Maybe you're a lawyer, maybe you're a doctor or or a business owner. You may even work for a professional sports franchise. But one way or the other, you've done a lot of really hard work to get to where you are. You've done 100% of the work. And nowadays you're continuing to get crushed by taxes. And that means you're only bringing home 50% of the reward. If you're tired of doing this over and over and you're looking for a solution to start to keep more of your money, you can go to firstgencp.com forward slash invest so that you can start to keep more of your money, which means that you can start to have the freedom to choose what you want to do, when you want to do it, with whom you want to do it. So once again, go to firstgencp.com forward slash invest to see how we can start to help you today. Once again, that's firstgencp.com forward slash invest. So if you want to know what it takes to go from developing analytics platforms to developing your long distance investing success, then guess what? Today's the conversation you're going to want to listen to until the very last word, I promise. You know why? Because today's guest not only started his professional career as a lead developer for an analytics platform company, I'm sure he's going to tell us a little bit more about that. He then continued in the software game and became a web developer. And then from there, you know what? He found this thing called real estate. And so he became a real estate investor and very quickly moved to a client relations specialist. And I'm sure that that has an impact on the things that he's doing today. And he'll tell us a little bit more about that. But listen to this. This is really, really, really impressive. So not only is he the owner of INW Properties, he is also the owner of MDM Properties, as well as a fellow podcaster in his super popular podcast. It's the Collecting Keys podcast. 
podcast. It gives me great pleasure to welcome to today's conversation, Mr. Mike DeHaan. Mike, welcome to the show, man. Hey, thanks, Billy. Appreciate you having me on. It's good to meet you. Yeah, pleasure to meet you as well, man. I appreciate uh, I appreciate you and I appreciate you deciding right up front to invest some time with me and the entire Going Long family. Help us learn more about you, the things that you have been doing and the lives that you are positively impacting. And I think real estate has just a little bit to do with some of that kind of stuff. So um, yes. <laughs> just a little bit. Just, 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 a, li- just a little bit. Yeah, just, yeah. A, just a wee bit. So here's the thing, Mike. You're going to get five questions. I know that I'm going to ask you five questions. You're going to get two in the beginning. You're going to get three at the very end. You're also going to get a lot more questions, but the ones in the middle, I just have absolutely no idea what those questions are. So I want the entire Going Long family to get to know you. I think you want them to get to know you as well. So if we go ahead and get started with question number one, which is help us understand where is it that you live in the U.S.? Yeah, so I live in Spokane, Washington. So I'm on the east side of Washington State, kind of like right on the Idaho border. All right, fantastic. Out on the uh, left coast of the U.S., but on the inside of the state, which is uh, which is phenomenal. So thank you very much for that. Then also to help us understand, Mike, what's the most positive thing that's happened to you in the last 24 hours? The last 24 hours? Oh, man. Um, I mean, the last 24 hours, I, I had a day yesterday where I was extremely busy just with everything else. And I had some positive affirmation that my uh, business is operating at a good level because even though I was distracted with a lot of personal things, the business kept rolling. So it meant we built the system and the team appropriately. So that was a very positive 24 hour (laughs) situation. That is so amazing. Like literally, like, thank you so much for taking that recognition or recognizing how important it is, right? That you are able as the business owner to be able to move and do other things, the days that you're distracted, the things, the days that life happens, and you get that affirmation that you built the, the the different processes in a way that allows you to go and do the things that you need to do or want to do in any specific day. And just having the the foresight to recognize that and, and be grateful for it is something that is very cool. So, and, and well done, by the way. Um, so here's, here's the other thing, Mike. So I'm kind of a, I try to be an overachiever. At least that's what I've tried most of my life. Usually it works out. Um, And sometimes that manifests itself in trying to do things that are almost impossible. Like Mm -hmm. tell your entire backstory in two and a half seconds. Not going to happen. You've done way too much. You've impacted way too many lives. (laughs) So forgive me for trying that, but that's kind of what it is. The thing is though, I kind of need your help, Mike. So I'm hoping that you can share your backstory in your own words. And also if you could help me out with one other thing. If you could share with me and the Going Long family, as you're telling your backstory, can you talk us through maybe some of those major decisions that you've made to get to this point in your journey? And then we'll see where we take the conversation from there. Yeah, absolutely. So yeah, so backstory, um, I grew up out in Montana uh, in what at the time was a a rural sort of area. Um, The area I grew up in is Bozeman, which is definitely popping now, but I, uh, growing up there, it was, you know, relatively, simple life for the most part like you know wasn't really a whole lot of big city stuff going on a lot of people that grew up there went the traditional route of you know going to local college staying there to work doing all that sort of thing when i graduated i opted to to leave and uh, come out here actually to spokane to go to gonzaga Um, i went a traditional path and i got an engineering degree you know made my parents proud that sort of thing after you know going through school i wasn't really into school and engineering but i did it just because that was kind of the expectation after I graduated was 2013. So it was shortly after the recession. Finding jobs was absurdly easy. I got a really good job out in Seattle right away um, working as an engineer. I jumped around a few jobs out there, um, worked at Boeing. You know, I worked at um, you know, different consulting companies, different stuff that was like, honestly, pretty bucket list item jobs for people, especially the Boeing career. And, you know, I just, quickly realized that I didn't like living out there and I didn't really like the the career path. Mm -hmm. So I I ended up moving back to Spokane. Um, I kind of like one last grasp of trying a a different job to sort of see if it would fit me a little bit better, just sort of being in like a smaller town. After a year at that job, you know, I'd been an engineer for five years and I was like, you know, I I can't keep doing this. It's not me. I'm not enjoying it. I was just a generally miserable person. So Mm -hmm. in January of uh, 2018, I quit and didn't really have any sort of plan to move forward um, or I guess any sort of plan on like what I was going to do. So I just decided to quit and figure it out, which, you know, depending on who you were talking to back then was either the dumbest thing I was ever going to do or the smartest thing. 
because I just needed some time to find myself, you know, and I was, I was about 20, 28 back then I was making, you know, six figures a year. I was doing very well. And I just decided that I needed to make a change. So I just quit and decided to, you know, travel and, and wander around and figure it out. Um, shortly after that, I, uh, started trying to figure out what I wanted to do. So I got into startups and tech, I taught myself how to be a web developer, taught myself how to code. That's when I started working for that main analytics company. Um, did that for a short period of time and it was an early phase startup. So I wasn't really getting paid much. And that was what brought me to real estate was as I started learning, trying to figure out how to make some extra money, I said, I need some passive income. So I have as much available time to work on the startup as possible. So I was like, cool, you know, reading different financial books and, and uh, you know, passive income books brought me to real estate, right? So I was like, great, I'll just go and start trying to buy some properties, okay? And that sort of like kicked off where I am now. Um, so I guess I liquidated my corporate 401k. Again, something that some people would think was foolish, but it was a choice that I made. Wait a second, wait a second, wait a second. Right? Hang on a second. Yeah. Oh, that's the part. That's the part. Okay, okay. That's the part right there. Yeah. <laughs> wait. <laughs> So, and I, and I hate to cut you off, but I just think oh, it's kidding, uh, amazing what you just said. Can you yeah. repeat what you just said? And then the part when I was talking over you that you this kind of completed the entire phrase, because I think that a lot of people are afraid to do this. And I actually see you that I'm still talking to you. You're still alive after you did this. Can you please repeat what you just said? Yeah. So, you know, obviously to start investing, I needed some capital. I didn't have a ton, but I did have a huge corporate, well, not huge. It was a significant corporate 401k from my time, especially at Boeing. Mm -hmm. And so I said, well, to meet my cash flow goals, I'm going to need to be able to buy properties. So I liquidated my 401k, paid all the penalties and all that sort of stuff. And I remember talking to people and everyone was, you know, treating me like I was doing something absolutely blasphemous, <laughs> but, you know, sucked it up. And I bought some properties, which have definitely outperformed the penalties that I paid to get out of it. So... So by the way, um, if if you are listening to the video to the audio version, I would gonna highly recommend everyone in the Going Along family to kind of go back to what I don't know, whatever we were just talking about, like 30 seconds before this, and look at Mike's face when he's on the video version, because he just mentioned that he sold his 401k, his qualified plan, he paid the penalties. He did say that when he liquidated. And I still I think I just saw a smile on your face after that. So um, it, it, you know, it's not necessarily for everybody. We're not giving anybody advice, but I guess it's important to see that it is possible to not have to wait until you're 59 and a half to start to get mm -hmm. into those qualified funds at the same time. Yes, there are penalties if you do them sooner. And yes, there are taxes you have to pay if you do them sooner. But if what you're going to move into still allows you to get to the lifestyle that you want, you may want to talk to Mike because he, he seems to be doing okay to me and he's got a smile on his face. So, yeah. so, so I appreciate you sharing that Mike and, and, and especially the, the, the part about the qualified funds. I think a lot of times there's so much people live in so much fear of doing that, that it holds us back. So, so one of the things that you had mentioned is back in 2018, you January 2018, I believe you said that you decided yeah. that it was time to stop and you had no mm -hmm. plan B. Yeah. But you also mentioned that you were in engineering and so that most people would say, hang on a second, engineers that don't have a plan B, that, that how does that even happen? So maybe talk yeah. to us, talk to us through that because there are two different schools of thought on on that, right? If you're going to make a change that you plan it out and or you go through 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 what you went through. Talk to us about why it why it was necessary for you in your context to not have a plan B? Yeah, so <clears throat> I guess full disclosure, I don't fit the typical engineering archetype, right? You know, the that that's one of the reasons I never enjoyed being an engineer. You know, the very strict attention to detail, um, and you know the sort of by the books mentality that many engineers have. I don't. I've always been kind of more of a disruptor. That was one of the issues that I had, especially in large corporate engineering roles where they wanted you to, you know, be very by the books. And I would just go and try to find every loophole I could to make my job as easy as possible. Mm -hmm. So I really had more of an entrepreneurial mindset. And for me to just leave like that, you know, I guess I initially thought that I had plans and then it took me approximately like, I don't know, a week after I quit to realize that those weren't my real plans, mm -hmm. you know? So I had these different thoughts of like going back to school and like doing all this sort of stuff. And within a week of leaving, I was like, yeah, I'm not going to do that. Let's be realistic. So, you know, I almost like tricked myself into it a little bit, I guess. 
Okay. And it, it was necessary for me to do that because I had been, you know, tied down to that regimented schedule um, from like, you know, going through high school, I worked jobs in the summers, you know, the second I graduated from high school, I went to college. Second I graduated from college, I started a job. And then like, even while I was in college, I worked jobs most summers, right? So I never really had the freedom, I guess, to sort of explore and find myself at all. Cause I'd always been on like a nine to five schedule, whether that was in school or in work. Mm -hmm. And so, I mean, ultimately I think pulling that plug, even though I didn't realize at the time was necessary for me to have the mental growth that was needed to be able to figure out how to get where I even wanted to get, you know, cause you know how it is when you're working a, a corporate sort of cycle like that, you know, you can, you can spend your time sort of dreaming, but then once, once you get off work, you're not going to have the mental bandwidth to really explore that or to take any action. And so I needed that space really to be able to do anything. No, I think that's, it's, so having that, having that uh, understanding of yourself is great. I talk to people all the time. I know you do too, Mike, but, you know, we talk to you know, people who are doctors, lawyers, and, and even mm -hmm. people in IT. And by the end of the week, they're so exhausted that they can't do anything other than just kind mm -hmm. of relax. So all the plans that they had of, hey, I wanted to do this. I wanted to travel here on the weekend, or I wanted to read this book. It's just so exhausted that they don't have the time to do any of that kind of stuff. So um, so it's it's interesting to hear that that perspective from you. One of the things, so you talked about, you made a comment that you were doing this and it sounded like maybe you were doing it because that's what your parents wanted you to do. And um, mm -hmm. I'm just curious also too, the the weight that education had in, in your home, number one, and then exposure that you may have potentially had to a real estate as an asset class as well growing up. Yeah, so the exposure to education, um, my mom comes from a very academic background. So my, my grandpa on her side was a, um, he was a professor at USC in Southern California. You know, they all went to USC and they had a very strong educational sort of uh, inclination on that side. Mm -hmm. My dad's side was actually extremely the opposite. So my dad was a entrepreneur. Um, everyone on that side of the, my family is an entrepreneur. So even like my family that lives over there with you in Europe, a lot of them are entrepreneurs, they have different businesses. Mm -hmm. And that's just sort of been the inclination there. That being said, you know, my uh, mom definitely drove the direction, right, for me as I was growing up. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, pushing towards college was something that was started as a very early age. Like I remember going to tour schools as early as like 14. Wow. Um, and, uh, you know, they were just sort of like prepping me for that, which is kind of funny looking at it because I did pretty much everything I could just show zero interest and <laughs> they just kept pushing it forward. Right. Um, so, uh, so, so that, that, that was my exposure to college. Like it was never really an, if it was always a, you know, you will sort of do that. Mm -hmm. And then in, in terms of real estate, I actually had zero exposure to real estate or investing or anything like that growing up. Okay. Um, so, you know, my, my dad being an entrepreneur, he done, he done okay for himself. And, you know, the house that, I grew up in, you know, they've owned since before I was born. So they okay. bought it a long time ago at a price back, you know, out in Montana, they didn't have to have a mortgage or anything on it. So they were able to buy it cash in like, you know, the eighties. And that was where I lived, you know? So they had, it, it's funny. I, I actually realized as I was going through this real estate journey that I was trying to like seek advice from my parents. And they're like, I don't know. They're like, I've never even gotten a mortgage before. They had no yeah. idea how to do any of that stuff. Right. Mm. And so it, it, for me, it was, you know, it wasn't like I'd seen it as an asset class and it made sense. I really had no exposure to real estate, honestly, until I, I kind of got lucky when I lived out in Seattle. My wife and I decided to buy a house purely just because we calculated that our mortgage would be less than the rent that we were paying. And we connected with a realtor out there um, who we've actually since done business with, who was kind of an investment minded realtor. Okay. And he just sort of like started talking to us about equity and, um, you know, all that sort of stuff. And then when we looked to move, real estate investing still wasn't on my plate, but he actually talked us into keeping it as a rental property. And, and he was like, he's like, you know, you have the ability to, um, you know, buy a new home out in Spokane, which is quite a bit cheaper. He's like, I know you're wanting to sell this place because you're moving. He's like, what if I manage it for you and you keep it as a rental? And that was kind of my initial foyer into, um, you know, investment properties in general was through this guy. How nervous were you about the, cause, so, and I'm, I'm just imagining, right? So you are, you're, you're getting ready to move you and your wife. You didn't think about real estate as an asset that you could mm -hmm. potentially have to generate income, things like that. 
and now you have, you're moving and you have somebody say, well, I'll manage this for you. Don't worry. I'll, I'll do that. Well, emotionally, yeah. how, how did that make you feel? I mean, I was okay with it. Like I've, I've always been, had a pretty high risk tolerance for stuff, Okay. you know, and I, I always had the viewpoint of, I don't know, worst thing that hap- that could happen is we could just sell it later. Okay. <laughs> okay. You know, like we, go we through it a couple like, months. We, if this doesn't work, then, yeah. Hey, look, we just put it on the market and we sell it. Okay. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Right. And then it was funny cause we moved back here and we had some tenants move in very shortly after we left and immediately we had to have some reparations in the property. And I remember the property manager called me and told me it was going to be $400. And I was like, Oh no, what have I done? $400. Like, I don't, I like don't even know if I can afford that. And I was so stressed yeah, and yeah. I was just like, man, I made a horrible mistake, but then it, it all, you know, obviously worked out, but yeah. Really hope you're enjoying today's conversation. And once again, if you're an accredited investor and you are tired of getting crushed by your W-2 taxes and you're looking for a new way to gain more control over your freedom to choose, go to firstgencp.com forward slash invest. Once again, that's firstgencp.com forward slash invest. Now let's get back to today's conversation. So, okay, cool. So, so no background in real estate. Mm -hmm. Um, You become an accidental landlord because the person that was going to eventually sell the house was the person that was managing the property for you. So that's, that's cool. But then you kind of take it to a whole nother extreme, right? Because one of the things that I know you're helping people today, cause you're like in six different locations where specifically with one of your businesses, you're helping people um, actually not necessarily have to live in the same place. You know, that's music mm-hmm. to my ears. That's what we love talking about here uh, in the going long uh, podcast and with a going long family, but it's super contrarian. Right. Because most people think you've got to live in the same place where you're buying the property because you've got to be a landlord and you got to drive there and you got to see it. Um, and most of the books that I read when I got started were that way. And that's kind of why I wanted to start this podcast because I don't think that that's the only way. I actually think you can live, you know, 8,000 kilometers from your property or 10,000 if you want or miles or whatever. Um, you just have to have systems in place and you have to have certain uh, things there. But what was it that allowed you or kind of gave you the impetus to go from? hang on a second, I'm an accidental landlord to now you are helping people in six different locations to actually invest beyond their backyard. Yeah. So I just, just to back up that a little bit. So as, as I started investing a little bit more uh, seriously myself, you know, I did that for um, a couple of years, 2018, 2019, I started flipping houses, um, mm-hmm. you know, back when I could just find them on, off the MLS. I didn't have a huge amount of money because I tied up all of my 401k funds in those first couple of rental properties that I bought. Mm-hmm. So I would just partner with people and they'd bring the money and I would help flip the house and we would split it. Um, at the end of uh, 2019, that started to get more and more difficult to find deals traditionally. So we started going off market and marketing mm-hmm. ourselves. Mm-hmm. Um, over 2020 and 2021, you know, I became, uh, I guess what people would call a wholesaler, right? So we, we find off market deals and we either sell them contracts by assignment or we buy them ourselves and we flip them or we keep them as rentals. Um, I started doing that mostly in Spokane and North Idaho, 2020 and 2021. We focused heavily in uh, Spokane and North Idaho, and we built out a pretty strong team and systems that was consisting of about, I guess, seven employees. We did 50 something transactions in 2021. And then as we got into 2022, we realized that we were tapping out our market in terms of potential just because, mm-hmm. you know, we couldn't really market anymore. It was just diminishing returns to find more opportunities. Yeah. So we started to go remote in January. And as we started to scale, um, we realized very quickly that the system that we had was very repeatable everywhere that we went. Um, so we, uh, we, we are now in six different markets. We have um, 17 employees and really like how our system works in these other markets, because the most challenging thing is with these other markets is, you know, a having the willingness to sort of like want to keep everything everywhere. Like, you know, I don't necessarily mm-hmm. want to keep like houses in eight different places around the country that would just be kind of a mess to manage. So right. how we started doing it is basically as a uh, wholesale for hire business. So we have the systems and the processes that we know how to scale and manage. Mm-hmm. So we partner with local people in those different markets and they, essentially hire us to find all the opportunities for them. And, you know, we, we collect a fee and then we uh, just partner with them and they become essentially the primary buyer for us in that market. So, okay. And so, and so, so if I'm, I'm listening here, like I'm a, I'm a busy IT sales professional. I live in a place where I don't necessarily want to 
um, where I don't think it makes the most sense for my return on my time, my sleep, my capital. And yeah. I'm listening to us, I'm listening to you today and I'm thinking, okay, well, that, that sounds really cool. Systems, that's something that rings a bell to me. Um, how would I engage with you or how would I find out more about, hey, listen, this is, is this something that, I, cause I like what you're saying, Mike, it sounds great in the different locations and systems, but how would I know that this is the right thing for me? Or potentially? Yeah, so for sure. So, so the, the key with buying real estate, right, is buying correctly. You know, you can go and overpay for properties and you're, you're, it's not going to be a great investment for you. And it's like buying at the top of the stock market. But even right now when the market's hot, if you're buying properties at a huge discount, you're probably going to be okay. And that's what we specialize in is finding those discounted properties. So, I mean, this is actually a, a real person that we have right now that we're working with. He lives in Orange County, California, very expensive market. He wants to buy homes in the Midwest. Okay. But the problem is he goes, talks to realtors over there. You know, all the homes are now worth triple what they were you know, three years ago, he goes and he talks to wholesalers over there and they're like, oh, you're from California. I'm going to charge you an absurd wholesale fee to buy this deal because I know you got the money. Right. So instead he comes to us and says, Hey, you know, I want to buy houses in Cleveland, Ohio. Like, perfect. So here's what we'll do. You're going to pay us a monthly fee to manage it. Um, you're going to pay for the marketing costs. We're going to run the entire system. And the trade-off for you is we're going to bring you houses at a huge discount that you can buy without having to pay the markup from the wholesalers over there. Because you're willing to take that risk, right? To sort of put your money out there for the marketing, but you don't have to build any systems. You don't have to do any process. You don't have to do any of that. And you basically just get to be the recipient of the opportunities that we create for you. And that works for us because it allows us to scale our systems in our business, which is what we're good at. And it mm -hmm. works for them because they have opportunities in a market that they're interested in holding in, right? Without having to go through all the nuances of, you know, finding the, the relationships and being beaten around by the local crew over there. Yeah. So what, what happens is you you're leveraging your expertise, your systems, mm -hmm. and as that busy high paid professional that wants to be in a new location, you are yeah. saving, you're helping them to save time. So bringing yeah. them ultimately the, the, the opportunities that would make the most sense for them and the location that they're looking for. Um, and so, yeah, whenever you can help to save some time, or a lot yep. of time, yep. it's usually yep. they, they, save, they save time and, and they're buying um, better deals because, you know, they're, they're getting them at a, um, a great discounted rate instead of the premium rate that everyone local over there is going to charge them just because they can. Yeah, makes sense. So talk to us because I know that this is one of your superpowers, right? You talk about systems and process, especially when you're looking at it from a remote perspective. Um, can you maybe talk to it? And obviously not giving away your secret sauce or anything like that, but just the role that systems and process plays for you and the value that you're adding for, uh, for others? Yeah. So, you know, as, as we've built it out, it off market real estate is very competitive, right? And the systems and processes that we run aren't that different from what you'd see people, you know, talk about on YouTube, like gurus. Right. But the difference that we have is we find like the little local touches to like sort of tweak the processes. Right. And we, mm -hmm. um, we, we find like the, the staff and people that run it, they're going to be extremely accountable to make the most out of the opportunities that are created. Right. So like the role that the systems processes play is they, since we have it all sort of like sussed out at the base level, it allows us to very easily just go and copy and paste the same systems everywhere. Mm -hmm. You know, like, like all we really need is, you know, a general source of data, which is easy to come by in the internet age. Um, we need a, uh, marketing sort of plan, which, you know, we do traditional stuff that everyone does, you know, direct mail, cold calling, texting, all those sort of items. Mm -hmm. But we put little spins on things, and this is our secret sauce, that make it reflect more with the local market. And it, it'll be just really, really basic things. Like, you know, even talking about stuff that's local to the area is enough to get over that, that threshold. You know, and we also don't send, um, you know, like standard, like, yellow, you're going to go into foreclosure sort of scammy letters. We send things that are branded. We send things that are professional, right? Mm -hmm. So there's a lot of time that goes into developing all that. But once you have that established, it's very easy kind of to go anywhere because right now consumers are skeptical of anything that isn't, doesn't seem credible and doesn't have any sort of paper trail. So if you can show that you can go anywhere. And then ultimately what you need to make this thing successful is skilled sales staff. And that was kind of the biggest change for us this year was we brought on a it's like true salesman. You know, we're not like so many of these real estate businesses where they're like, I'm going to find some young, hungry kid who's going to just come and 
you know, try to figure this out. Right. Like, and they're going to be my, my face on the ground. Cause I don't want to do it. We have like legit sales guys. They're going to make, you know, $250,000 this year, mm. you know? Mm. So, so that was a big caveat as well that I started to become, become super successful in, in these different markets is, I mean, we have killers that are out there that are used to closing deals and making money. Yeah, you yeah. Know? And that's our big competitive advantage over everything else at this point. Yeah. And so one of the things that Mike, and so, and I know we were talking about this before, but like I, I, that's, I come from a software sales, an enterprise software sales background. And a lot of people that listen and, and are members of the going long family, uh, I like to say, understand that, right? Because there are a lot mm -hmm. of sales professionals here, a lot of enterprise software sales executives here. And so when you hear it's, it's, it is, there is a difference between someone who has lots of potential uh, versus someone that has lots of talent, right? Because that mm -hmm. talent has been honed over, over time. And the fact that you're leading your organization in a direction that is, you know, we, you want to have professional sales, sales professionals that have experience. Um, what that does is it, it's going to be a, another better reflection of you or a reflection of you that is very in line with what you were saying before um, in terms of being able to put on that professional, that, that level of, of prestige. So, mm -hmm. um, and speaking of which, and then and then we're going to go into the go along final three, but I, I do want to know, like, could you talk a little bit about the secret sauce? But I also, I, I, and I get this strong sense from you that experience is really important. And so mm -hmm. maybe you can talk to us about the the client experience, because I'm I'm listening to you and a lot of the things that I'm saying, like I'm, I'm the person that's watching and listening to us, like it really sounds interesting and I like control of things and it sounds like you're going to be able to give me control, help me save some time. Um, but talk to me a little bit about what that experience is like for the person that, that wants to engage with you and, and with your, with your team. Yeah. So, you know, we, we definitely try to make client experience a key priority, especially because the, out, the original outlay of money is relatively significant to start a marketing campaign. Um, but you know, the returns that you get on it are significant, you know, especially once you start to buy properties at, you know, 50, 60% off. Right. So you know how it works is we do an initial onboarding call where we get into all the details about what exactly you're looking for and we custom tailor our basic systems for whatever their priorities are you know like our business it isn't a um like a high volume business where we're trying to have like a thousand clients nationwide that we're doing this with it is like a boutique experience right so realistically we'll have you know as we're starting to scale if we could get to 30 or 40 clients that we're working with that are just out there having an awesome experience like that's perfect for us because there are the little te tweaks that every market needs for like you know for the the market like the marketing i find the opportunities but there's also the the tweaks that our client as an investor is going to need in terms of how they want to be communicated with you know how they want to be receiving their data how they want to go through their processes how they want to do their due diligence and our goal is to provide exactly whatever that optimal situation is for for people right especially because we understand everyone has a different level of risk tolerance different level of experience you know they're going to have different things that they're looking for so you know as we go through it you know we we keep people up to date with the marketing we give them reports on how their marketing is operating um as we go through the whole acquisitions process and we start to get things under contract we work with them to make sure that they're getting all the information that they need on every property that we're bringing them and we make sure that the sellers especially because we're usually working with motivated sellers are you know going to be leaving the house with how they said they're not going to do anything weird like damaging the property as they leave or not leaving the property we facilitate the entire process so in an ideal situation what it looks like is you know they're outlaying the capital and sort of allowing us to do our thing and then we have the entire thing down to like basically cleared and ready to go for them so they can just show up to closing and be ready to go you know of course after they walk it or, or do their deal whatever they want to do so it really is like a turnkey wholesale service where they are just getting awesome opportunities without having to do any of the dirty work that we have to do on the acquisition side Gotcha. So. Fantastic. So I appreciate you, appreciate you letting us know more about that. And I'm sure we're going to give it an opportunity to, uh, to know more about how we engage with you and your teams. Um, yeah. but you know, we kind of got to get into the going long final, <clears throat> the going long final three. I get all choked up about talking about it, but the thing is, Mike, I never ask anybody to go along final three, unless, um, you as our special guest, unless you tell me that you're ready. So are you ready? Yeah, I'm ready. I knew you'd be ready, man. Plus, this is going to be a lot of fun because you've already been over here. So the very yeah. first of the going long final three 
has to do with, well, this is now my adopted side of the of the pond. Uh, even though I'm originally from Columbus, Ohio, I've been living over here in Europe for the last 21 years. So I would love for you to share with me and the Going Long family, Mike, what is your favorite European city that you've either visited, which I know you've visited many, or is still on your bucket list to visit? Yeah, so that I've visited, I, mean, I can give you both. Or bucket list, I, I, either, I either, love, either one, either one, whatever you want. Yeah. What, what is that one city? Yeah. So I, I love Munich. Um, you know, I, I, I've traveled through there. I, I like, you know, that the Germany as a whole, I think it's just a super fun country. Mm. And, you know, Munich is one of those places that, uh, you know, you go and it's so clean. So I, I love there. I also love um, Zurich, Switzerland. You know, they're, they're kind of similar, but also different, but both those countries are probably my, both those cities are probably two of my favorites. And then bucket list. I always wanted to go to Prague. Um, I haven't done Prague yet, but I, I would love to go there at some point. It was something that was on our list in 2020 before um, all the COVID stuff happened. So I'm hoping to do an Eastern Bloc trip here at some point in the future as well. well. I, have, I have no doubt that you will make probably all three of those cities. But what is the one that you're going to suggest? What's the one you're going to go with today? Yeah. So if I had to like suggest one. Yep. Which yeah, one of those three? Zurich, Prague or, or Munich? Uh, so it was my favorite. I'd say Munich. Okay. Um, we'll my, my, my bucket, my bucket list one is Prague. Okay. Well, we're going to go with Munich. Cause I see your face light up and smile and all that kind of stuff. I spent a month in Prague back in 2006 in January. Um, I would That's recommend cool. that you go in the summertime. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it is a wonderful it's city. Yeah. It's very, very cold, but it's beautiful. Absolutely beautiful. Just gorgeous. Um, so anyway, so question number two, and this really, Mike, it has a lot to do with the, the exposure and the experience that I've had being around very successful people. And, you know, I consider you to be someone who's very successful. You're going out, you're impacting lives and, and you're having a lot of, a lot of positive impact. And so you, I'm sure you've probably seen something very similar to me when, when those people that are very successful, one of the reasons that makes them successful is because typically they, unlike most people, when they have a plan, they put the plan together, they go in, they execute the plan, they get everything that they put in the plan right the first time, which then allows them to go even faster. In um, don't worry, Mike. It's just a joke. That's just a joke. That part was just a joke. <laughs> that part was just a joke. Of course, nobody gets things perfectly the first time, especially people that are really successful. They do never, ever, ever get things right. Well, not never, ever, ever. Um, a lot of times they do, but many, many times, probably 20 to 50 times more than most people, they're making mistakes, learning opportunities, having these types of experiences. And so this is real. This is not a joke. Because every single time that someone who is successful has a relevant mistake or learning opportunity or whatever word you want to put on it, things didn't work out like they were supposed to. Every time it's relevant, without a doubt, they stop, they take note, and they learn from that experience. And then most importantly, they go out and they put different strategies, tactics, and actions into place to minimize the probability of that exact same thing happening again. Mm -hmm. So I'd like to ask you not to think about the mistake or the learning opportunity, but really what's the lesson? What's the one lesson that you know that the Going Long family needs to learn from you or have you share with us today? What's that one lesson you'd share with us? So I think that the biggest lesson that I've learned over the past couple of years is that reaching like whatever your financial freedom or like your net worth or income goal is, realistically is not as hard as you're making it out to be <laughs> like honestly this is one of the biggest things as we've started to make money like you know I, I i've especially with our wholesale and our flipping business i mean i remember back when i uh when i quit my job i wrote a little list of goals and i stuck it actually in a real estate investing book and i found that when my wife and i we moved into a new house for ourselves this past summer and i was like looking at the goals and i was like these are just like laughably low goals you know, my goal was like, if I could make $5,000 a month, like I'll be happy. Right. You know, just things that are so, so basic. Right. And, you know, and it was like, my, my had a goal that was 10 properties in 10 years. You know, we, we, we've, we've had months where we've bought 10 properties now. Right? Like I, I've had, I've had months where I've made more than my old annual salary. Yeah. You know, as a, as a corporate engineer. And, and the crazy thing is, is those things didn't even necessarily happen with immediate intention. They happened as a result of taking drastic, consistent action, 
right? And if you're yeah. intentional about things, it's amazing how fast that stuff can change. Yeah. So being intentional has amazing uh, benefits, especially when you are intentional and you're taking action and you're doing that consistently. I only laughed earlier because I had a, I had a almost the exact same goal. I had a, a, a 5K goal and yeah, that it was in a part of a five-year plan and you do that in 18 months and you're like, well, hang on a second. I, I, why, yeah. why did I not shoot even higher, right? And so um, I, I love hearing you say that because it is, there's just something powerful about when you write things down and you become intentional. So I appreciate that, Mike. And, and then lastly, and this is just one of the things before we go is to help fill our minds with knowledge. So, so what is the one book that you would recommend to the Going Long family today? Yeah. So I love never split the difference. Mm. Um, it's a, you know, it's a, it's a sales book, but I think that a lot of the tactics that are discussed in there are very applicable to any sort of conversation, honestly. Um, cause you know, you're always, everyone who says they're not in sales, you are like every time you have a conversation with somebody, you're trying to sell them on you and why they should interact with you. I mean, even you and me, Billy, when we hopped on this call, we both subconsciously had a sales process going on in our head about why, we should give each other the time of day. You know, you you have you have that with every stranger that you meet, every business, um, you know, uh, meetup that you go to, every opportunity that you have to talk to, even like a stranger. There's a little bit of a sales process, mm -hmm. and studying never split the difference. There's just like little nuances to that that can really help a lot, just in terms of like how to manage your tone, like how to approach certain sort of like negotiations. I mean, even some of the stuff he goes in there about stuff with like your kids. You know, about like how to, you know, if you're going to negotiate with your kids, you know, anchor high or anchor low. So that way, when they when they try to negotiate with you, you can get exactly what you want. You know, just little stuff like that, I think, is super applicable. So that's a great book I recommend for everyone. Yeah, it is absolutely a great book. One that is highly recommended by many people, teaches you things like labeling and, and mirroring and all these kinds of fun mm -hmm. things that, of course, Mike, you and I know what we're talking about. And so once you read the book you'll also know what we're talking about. So I appreciate yeah. you, you you sharing that with us and we're gonna make sure that we include that as well in the show notes, Mike. And uh, man, listen, I just, I, it's fantastic being able to just think about, it. it's unfortunate because these conversations go by so quickly, but it is just one of these things where I think, wow, we're starting to talk about your positive mindset and really going from uh, Montana to where you are and then you're having, you're doing uh, Gonzaga and then you, you really wanted to make your parents proud, I think is the way that you described it earlier and kind of working on your degree. And then you got those dream jobs, those bucket list jobs in IT and out in Boeing. And that was amazing. And you know what? You also too, at a very early on in the corporate career, kind of realized that, you know what, this is probably not for me. And rather mm -hmm. than going down that traditional path, you are an engineer with the kind of wired a little bit differently and say, hey, look, I'm just going to pull the ripcord, no plan B, and we're going to figure this thing out. And so uh, from there, you've gone, went out, you taught yourself tech, you taught yourself how to get into new place, positions, new roles, and then you became an accidental landlord by this really yeah. cool broker. And so not only did that will start to help change the way that you saw the world and saw different things and being someone who takes nice calculated risks, it's now since opened up a world for you where you have multiple businesses, you are now having your podcast, you're consistently impacting lives, you're helping people get out of their own mind and being able to invest remotely, long distance, we like to call it here. Um, and I know that there's so many people that are here that are watching us, that are listening to us, they're thinking, yeah, Billy, just ask him the question, man. So listen, Mike, what is the best way for the Going Long family to, to reach out, to connect with you, to find out more about what you're doing and how you can potentially help them? Yeah. So, um, the best way to reach out to me is via Instagram. Um, just on like a, a large scale, I'm at Mike underscore invests on Instagram. You can uh, shoot me a DM on there. I always love to chat with people. And then if you want to inquire about, uh, either my podcast or our wholesale for hire business, we're calling it done for you deals. Um, you can email me at Mike at collecting keys or Mike at mdm.properties. So it's not.com on that. It's just mdm.properties. So either of those, um, you can reach out to me or on Instagram and uh, always looking to connect with people. So, All right. Awesome. And you know what, Mike, we're going to make it really easy for everybody. So all you're going to have to do, you can find either of his two emails as well as his, um, his Instagram by mm -hmm. just going to the link where all you have to do is click a link and you can connect with Mike. We'll make it really, really easy. So uh, listen, Mike, I appreciate you deciding to be here with me, with the Going Long family and investing your time with us, man. Thank you so very much. Really, really appreciate it. Yeah. Thanks, Billy. It's great to come on. Appreciate you having uh, me. 
All right, cool, man. If you give me like 15 seconds, then I'll let you out of here, I promise. Uh, really Thank quickly, you. just want to say the last words to the Go Along family. Um, today, listen, Mike has shared so much valuable information, life experience, uh, and he's helped even give you a path to connect with him. Take today's conversation. Make sure that you've already downloaded it. Share it with a couple of people. Have conversations. Talk about what it's like to go from one place to the next and become maybe an accidental landlord. Or you've, maybe you're an engineer and you wanted to do something different and you're in a similar space. Mike's been there. Reach out to him. Talk to your friends. Talk to your family. Do those types of things. And you know what? While you're doing that, I'll be here. I'll be preparing for the next conversation. So until then, go out and make it a great day. And thank you very much. Once again, today's conversation was sponsored by First Generation Capital Partners. If you want to find out more, go to firstgencp.com forward slash invest.